Another episode here of Getting There with Gaz, where we talk about the career journeys of athletes, coaches, business owners, media members from upstate New York, Capital Region tie, a little central New York tie for this one. Brian Higgins joins us. Uh, Brian, for those who might not be familiar with you, let's go back a younger version of you, six, seven, eight years old. Where'd you grow up? What'd you want to be as a kid? And was it that same dream job you wanted when you were 18 years old? Well, Tom, first off, thanks for having me on. This is uh, really cool. And, uh, uh, it, you know, great to get back uh, with people in the capital region, even though I'm not that far down the road uh, in, in Syracuse. You know, uh, two hours is is short or long, depending on uh, how you look at it, I guess. And, uh, uh, it, you know, to go back to that age when I was six, clearly I was going to be the next quarterback of the New York Giants. So that didn't quite work out uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, the five eleven, six foot uh, guys who don't play football generally uh, don't get drafted by the Giants. So I... Uh, uh, figured out the next best thing, and that's uh, talking about the Giants and the Syracuse and all those teams. So I, I think I knew I wanted to do this in some way fairly young. I, I'm primarily a play-by-player now. I don't know if I knew I wanted to do that just because I didn't. You know, you're that young. You don't really know the difference uh, between those two things. But, you know, I, I grew up as a Syracuse uh, fan. My dad is originally from uh, Syracuse. So that, that goes uh, way back. We always had the, the Cuse basketball and football games on. And, uh, then when you get a little bit older, you start to realize, Hey, this Bob Costas guy's pretty good. Where'd he go to school? Syracuse. And uh, he was my guy back then. And then you add on everybody else, you know, Tariko, uh, McDonough, I, I, we could name a hundred guys. And you're like, wow, all of these guys went to Syracuse. I like Syracuse. And then it all kind of ties together, Tom. So I, I think that's uh, kind of how it goes back that, uh, you know, love sports, watched it all the time growing up. And then it just so happens that when the school you watch the most also happens to have the best school for the thing you think you might want to do, I, I guess it gets you to the end of your decision a, a, a lot faster. <laughs> By the way, for our audio side audience, if you see our visual side, it is covered in orange stuff. Uh, Ryan's yeah. got his setup. I got my setup. So this is a full Syracuse love fest for sure on our visual side. There's no doubt. Uh, you mentioned the college decision about where you're going to go. Was it simple and easy as that? That Look, I knew Syracuse is my spot. I applied to one school and that was going to be it. Uh, you know, I, I, you can't apply only to one school, I, I suppose. That would be uh, aggressive. But, uh, you know, I applied to uh, the schools you'd, you'd think about it, Syracuse, uh, Northwestern, BU, I mean, the, the primary broadcast schools. And, you know, I was uh, in a good position to have my pick of it when, when it came down to it. And you think about it. And uh, in the end, uh, for a variety of reasons, it's, uh, it's all those reasons. Uh, Syracuse, when you, you compare it to the other schools, is the better uh, broadcasting uh, school, nothing against the, you know, Northwestern or BU. They were maybe more aligned in, in the print realm or, or whatever. And, and it just goes back to, it, it's the school I've always followed. Um, you go on the tour at Syracuse, at least then I'm, I'm sure it's a uh, different now and you get, you go on a tour of new house. And at the time it was kind of a self-guided thing. And they hand you like an audio cassette player that has a, a tour that's guided by Bob Costas. Like, well, Huh, how about that? I'm, I'm sure we're not handing out uh, tapes uh, to people walking around uh, Newhouse these days. <laughs> At least I'd hope not. I, I don't quite know that process anymore. But you're like, huh, so uh, Bob's uh, Bob's in the tape player too. And at the time, the student radio station, WAER, it's now in a different part of campus. At the time, it was in the building of uh, Newhouse. And I didn't really know anything about that at the time until I went on that tour. I'm like, wow, look at, look at that. All of these people kind of cut their teeth at this station. This better be a thing I do. And, you know, it all comes together. Um, I, I'm sure all those other places would have been fine places to go to go to school and to produce many, 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 many uh, broadcasters, uh, as has Syracuse. But it's one of those things, when, when it was already in the lead due to all those other things, uh, none of the others had the ability to catch up and break the tie in their favor. One of my favorite things to talk about with Syracuse alumni, because it's a good lesson for whatever, whether it be a freshman or a young person going into broadcasting, is that first day when you show up on campus. Can you take us through whether it was WAR or Z89, whoever it might be, that that intimidation factor, fear, excitement? You know what I'm talking about? That first day you show up to campus and you look left and you look right, and you're like, okay, there's a lot of me's on campus all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, it's hard to say how much it has changed over the years, that feeling about it. Like, I showed up, obviously, you know Syracuse, and you know Newhouse. You know that name when you're in high school or whatever and you're thinking about it. Like, that's very out there. I did not, at the time, know as much about the various opportunities you had as a student to do stuff. WAER is what I spent primarily my four years doing. Uh, at the time, I'd say it was less likely that you would do like nine different things. Like there's WAR, the Daily Orange is the student paper. You mentioned WJPZ, that's the other uh, student radio station. And and now, and my goodness, people my age would have, would have cut off body parts for this had it existed back then. But ACC Network Extra, like the kids going to school now are calling games essentially for ESPN on television. Now, yes, it's the streaming product. And it, yes, maybe it's uh, a softball or a field hockey game instead of football or basketball. Uh, but you're calling games for something that looks like ESPN. Now, what I've noticed now is the students come in in a way where they are very aware, I think, of all this stuff existing, at least a lot of them. Back then, your pre-social media, I mean, not that I'm that old, but my goodness, uh, it's amazing uh, how, how much happens in 20-some-odd years. But yeah, the internet's there, but all, all this stuff isn't there to really know everything about it going in. So it was more like you show up and you figure it out once you're there. Now I think a lot of students come in having a preconceived idea, right, wrong, or otherwise, of uh, what's available, what they're going to do. I'm going to do all these things. For me, it was, hey, I heard about WAER literally on this audio tape on this tour. All of the people I know of that I watch on TV doing stuff that went to Syracuse did this radio station. I should probably do that. So you go up there, you find the sign-in sheet, you go to the intro meeting, and you just kind of go from there. That, that was kind of my path of how I, I got into it. I, I think it's different, Tom, for 18-year-olds uh, that show up today. I think you, they, and again, not all of them, I, I think you're at least equipped with the tools to show up knowing, okay, I need to go here, 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 here. I got to sign up for all this. Back then it was for me, okay, I know about this place. This is the place to be. I better get there. And from then it was just kind of, uh, you fly by the seat of your pants and uh, you look and see what the older kids are doing. <laughs> Thinking back about it now, you're right. It is intimidating. The The seniors, in hindsight, my freshman year at WAR, um, a Capital Region uh, guy, at least uh, where he worked at uh, early in his career, Andrew Catalan. Uh, things are working out all right these days <laughs> for Andrew. Um, uh, another guy in that same class, Damon Amendolora has a, a big time CBS uh, radio network uh, radio show. And another guy in that same year, this is three guys in the same year, Carter Blackburn, who has called a ton of games uh, for CBS and elsewhere. So you see those three guys and legitimately you're 18, they're 22 at the time. It's four years. It's nothing at the time. It feels like they're 50 years older than you. Like, wow, how could I possibly do what these guys are doing now? 20 years later, you're like, Oh, those are three of the best to come out of here over a 20 year span, it makes a whole lot more sense. But well, when that is what's sitting there, when you walk in as an 18 year old, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit intimidating. Yeah. And for sure, like the change of the last 15 years, of, okay, someone can pull up YouTube or a podcast and get reps, which is great. That's mm -hmm. awesome. But when you're in that spot in Syracuse, you have to get cleared to get on the air. Like that yeah. itself is a whole process of your fellow students listening to your tape and saying, all right, are you good enough today? Because some people might not get cleared until they're upper class, but I'm not sure if you have a unique story about when you get cleared and how much effort, whether it's updates, whether it's play-by-play -play of, I just want to get an opportunity to get on the air. And that alone is difficult for some students. Uh, yeah, and um, I'm sure it's the same now, but at least in my day, you know, a lot of people that showed up at that first meeting uh, never, never were on the air at WAER. I, I, don't, I think a lot of people show up at that first meeting and they hear, okay, Here's what you have to do. You need to be at the radio station once a week at five in the morning to write sportscasts that are never going to be heard by anyone except other people in this room. Um, a lot of people don't come back for meeting two after that. Right. A lot of people don't uh, want to wake up at, at four in the morning, uh, walk down from Mount Olympus, down from Day Hall across campus at you know five in the morning across the campus that you've been there for a week and a half and you got no idea you're left from your right to get to a building that you don't really know how to get into at 4.35 in the morning or, or what you're doing. But that is what you do. Why is that what you do? Because that's what you're told you have to do. 
uh, to get on the air. And everybody that you have heard from that went to Syracuse that followed the same path did the same thing. You show up at 5 in the morning, uh, some upperclassman, some junior at the time that feels like he's 10 years older than you, gives you a sound bite and says, use this, and you write and record a two-minute sportscast. And you do that over and over and over again until you are deemed good enough by somebody slightly older than you that you get to be on the air. I was not on the air until my junior year. And so that, that is two years of doing stuff that is never heard by anybody. So you got to be willing to commit to that stuff and understand it, it is not an instant gratification thing. I think a lot of people lose uh, the desire to do it along the way when you find that out. I did not. And then once you get in there, you're good and you go and uh, you go as far as it takes you. But uh, you're certainly right, Tom, like the process of getting on the air at especially WAER, I think that's what separates people. That's what makes Syracuse special in some way. You got to survive that. You're not just given a microphone and said, OK, here's a basketball game. You're on the air. Good luck. No, you need to prove that you deserve it first. And it adds a competition aspect which I think makes all the Syracuse students that did that more prepared when they come out of school than maybe people from other schools. And you know what? You have to be decent to be on the air. You can't just stink and get on the air. And I think that matters too. Like you get coached up by students and students that have professionals above them that are, you know, there's guidance. I mean, it's not just a, a free run situation, but I, I think that's really important to, uh, you know, you don't get to you don't get to completely stink and be on the air. You, you got to have some guide rails, and I think that uh, is really important. There's some lessons to that too, because it takes you until your junior year to get on the air. But with your story of being a Syracuse fan, growing up in upstate New York, mm -hmm. grinding at it for two years, by the time your junior year hits, there's got to be not just a sense of accomplishment, like "Hey, I did this," like "I strive for it," "I got it," "I'm here," "I'm doing it," but also a sense of "I know how hard I worked for this." Let's show what I can do now. Like, I'm on the field. I'm getting the opportunity to start. Let's make some plays now. When you got those first broadcasts in your junior year, was that maybe self-inflicted pressure of, like, let's make this happen now. I've got the stage. i got to perform. Well, I mean, it's some of it. Like, once you get on the air, like, the, the first time you're literally on the air, if you say you're not nervous, like, either you're lying <laughs> or you, you know, or your Mike Tarico or Costas or something. And who knows? They, they were probably nervous their, their first times too. But like either you were sent down that this was your calling and you're, you're ready to go, or you, you better be nervous. Like, why wouldn't you? Like, if you're a doctor the first day on the job, you can have all the training in the world, but you got to have some nerves, like literally the first time you're seeing a patient for real, right? Like, I mean, right. I know it's not the same thing, but the first time the red light comes on and the words you were talking about are on radios of people's cars that are driving around town, yeah, you better be nervous. Um, so, I mean, you start with sportscast and simpler stuff, but the first game I ever broadcast, and for those that don't know, and there's no reason most of you would know, like generally the way the games are done, two students are paired together, and WAER does football, basketball, men's lacrosse, and has done so for it's more than 75 years now. And every game, don't miss a game. Um, and you – Depending on how it works, um, you either flip a coin of who gets what half or depending on a seniority situation, that uh, is how you get what half. The first game I ever did turned out to be Carmelo Anthony's final game in the Dome. Syracuse Rutgers early March 2003. Now, things you don't know at the time, it also turned out to be literally the last Syracuse men's basketball game that was not televised ever. <laughs> oh. there were, I don't know why, <laughs> how this ended up, TV contracts, whatever. I mean, this is 03, so it's not that long ago, but it's long enough ago that the streaming options and stuff, like not everything landed everywhere. Whatever reason, this game wasn't on TV. So we, we know how Syracuse does. Large crowds, 34, 35,000 breaking records. It's usually done very on purpose. Like you usually know when a record is going to be broken. Syracuse broke the on-campus basketball attendance record that day by accident. So you got to show you show up in the building. You're trying to get there early. Let's talk about nervous. First game you're ever calling on the air. Yeah, you're nervous. You show up. You're trying to get to will call to get your passes to get in the building. We couldn't get to the window because there were so many people. Like you couldn't literally get through. Now, actual gates 
at the time, if memory served, opened an hour and a half before the game. So we're there two hours plus before, whatever, trying to get in, get set up, get the whole thing. But we can't get to the window to get our passes to get in the building. Let's just say that did not help with the nerve situation. <laughs> Like that, that, that's not that, like you talk about things that calm you down. That not it, that not it. So, you know, finally get in the building and everything's great. And it, it's unbelievable. I, I called the game that day with Andy Demetra, who is now the voice of Georgia tech. He was a year older than me. And it, you know, it went, I, I think as well as it, it could go for first ever game, you know, it Carmelo broke the uh, Syracuse freshman uh, scoring record. Uh, that day, obviously, uh, notable things happened in the month uh, after that. But, <laughs> you know, that's one of those things. To, like, you don't forget stuff like that. That was broadcast one. I broadcast a bajillion Syracuse games since then. But uh, you never forget uh, the first one, especially when it goes down like that. All right, let's talk about post-graduation. Eventually, as much fun as you're having at Syracuse getting to call Carmelo Anthony basketball games, the national championship team, and all this great stuff, eventually they tell people at Syracuse, you cannot live here. You have to leave. You have to go find another job. Although... In your case, we're going to get to that. That might be a little <laughs> bit different. But uh, take us through post-graduation. How did that process work for you looking for that first professional job? Well, um, I, I'd say I had my first professional game before I graduated, which uh, helped, well, in, in twofold. Um, I did Tri-City Valley Cats games. Uh, that team came into existence, well, moved from Pittsfield anyway, and came into existence at the Joe in 2002. So I spent three summers doing that over the summer. I did it after my uh, sophomore year, which was 02 in its uh, first year, my junior year in 03. And then my senior year, I was the lead play-by-play -play guy for the Valley Cats. That was 04. So I was already doing some stuff on a professional uh, level, which helped. Uh, also, what happened my senior year in 04, that – an opportunity came about late February, early March that year uh, to call the men's lacrosse games uh, for, at the time, it was the Syracuse ISP Sports Network, uh, onwards to IMG, and now Learfield, all the, the same thing over the years. Uh, Matt Park, who's now the voice of the Orange, was in a job that was not the job I have now, but was ish the job I have now at the time. He got a gig calling Binghamton Mets games, couldn't do the lacrosse games, needed somebody to do the lacrosse games. Uh, there I was. I got that job. So you talk about, oh, well, uh, they make you leave campus. I'll say this. No, they don't. If you get a job uh, <laughs> working essentially for the same place, they let you stay and they'll pay you for it. So that, that worked out pretty well. Like it, it just rolled into like I did the lacrosse games that spring. I was like, wow, that was great. Got to look for a job. Uh, I've got this Valley Cats thing, figure something out for the fall. I actually had pretty well lined up the Siena women's basketball job uh, for that for that upcoming season, which was another thing where I could have lived at home and, and done it from there. And then um, one thing leads to another. Mark Johnson, who was the voice of the Orange at the time for two years, uh, gets the job as the voice of Colorado, where he still is. Matt bumps up to that job. Uh, the job that became my job is open over the summer. And I, I'd say you get to be a leader in the clubhouse for that job when you were literally doing that job two months before that. So it all just kind of timing wise, Tom, it, it worked out in a way that it doesn't often uh, work out. I think that that summer that it, it just kind of all rolled. And in the fall, I went back to Syracuse like I never left. I, will, I have so many follow ups to that. I, I want to put a, just a pin on that first thing because I want to offer some perspective for the Valley Cats for the Central New York listeners because I feel mm -hmm. like people in the Syracuse area maybe don't understand the impact of the Valley Cats in the Capital Region for a Capital Region native like you are. Explain a little bit about what the Valley Cats really mean to the Capital Region and why that's a great opportunity for someone still in college. Well, and you know, it's changed over the years, obviously, and unfortunately, it's changed here in the last couple of years that the, they're no longer affiliated. And all that, and we could, I'm sure you have, and <laughs> we could spend a million hours talking about how uh, Major League Baseball is uh, doing stupid stuff uh, to the minor leagues. But, you know, Valley Cats came in in 02. I'm old enough to remember going to Albany Colony Yankees games uh, back in the day. I'm certain I must have seen like Jeter and Bernie Williams. I mean, you're six or whatever you don't quite remember who the players are at the time but uh, math says they had to be there uh, so you know I, I used to go to those games uh growing up and then affiliated ball is gone the diamond dogs follow that at, at heritage park so you go to those games 
Uh, but then, you know, when affiliated baseball comes back, like that's a big deal. When when the Joe opened up, like that's a really nice uh, little 5,000, whatever it is, seat stadium. That's a really good place to go and watch a game. Now, I, I think uh, they got decent crowds the first year, and I, I got to call games alongside George Miller, who was the voice of the team the first year, and he came along from uh, Pittsfield and had previously done games uh, for UMass when uh, Marcus Camby was playing there and the whole deal. So he was a great guy to work with the first year. But that, that just turned out to be a great first opportunity for me. And at the time, uh, those games were on uh, legitimately on various actual radio stations in the area. It was not a streamed thing. It was not a thing you automatically had uh, to seek out. So to to be on the radio for the first time and have people tell you, hey, I was driving around. I heard you in the car. Like, that was pretty cool. That, that's a great opportunity. And I, I, I say this to students now. Like, whether or not you are a baseball person, like to do a baseball season and the Valley cats for short season. So again, it's, it's only 76 games, uh, not 144 or 130 or whatever it is at various minor league levels. But when you do 76 games in 79 days, you learn a lot <laughs> one way or another, like that, that's a lot. And I, I think it's for one, you cut your teeth on it. You do 76 games in 79 days. Uh, you're going to be on the air a lot. You're going to get a lot of experience that you do not get as a student. That's real. You're on. The, that's a lot of air that needs to be filled. And you learn about what it's like to be around a team, what it's like to be on the bus, what it's like to show up on time to be on the bus, what it's like to make sure you're wearing the right uh, shirt or whatever to be on the bus, what it's like to even though the baseball players are give or take the same age as you are, they are professional baseball players. They are getting a check. This is their life. They are trying to make the major leagues. Like what it's like to be around them, what it's like to be around, you know, the managers and the pitching coaches, sometimes people that have been doing this for 30 years. Like there's a lot to learn. And I'd say, Tom, stuff like that is invaluable. Like whether or not you like baseball, it doesn't matter. Like, that's the sport that's in the summer. They got a bajillion games. There's 8 million teams out there. I, I say this to all young broadcasters. Like, if you can get that job and go do it, do it for a summer, whether or not you like baseball, it's not about that. It's about for this four or six months, it, you're going to learn as much or more than you ever did in college about uh, what the real world of this stuff is like. There's something special about, I almost like I call it a fraternity of people that you need to join this, whether it be the minor league level, even if it's like the summer college baseball leagues, I know across upstate New York, you got yeah, the Syracuse yeah. Stallcast, the Spartans, uh, Glens Falls, Albany Dutchman, you got people across upstate New York. It is a cool thing to do. I'm definitely with you on that. Grind the teeth doing summer baseball for sure. All right, let's flip back to that Syracuse job because again, to offer some perspective here that I hope some people understand, some may be learning this for the first time. That is incredibly rare. I know casually looking back on it 15 years, 10, like looking back on it, it's like, oh, this is what happened. No, like you had Doug Logan forever. And mm -hmm. then you had that quick area with Mark Johnson, who you mentioned goes off to Colorado, gets the championship season. Then it's a combination of Matt and you. But since then, there's been like barely any movement, right? Like it's once in what, 20, 25, 30 years where the guy who is the top college broadcaster slips in a role like i know you get it but i think we need to explain like that's incredibly rare at syracuse and you've got hundreds of students wanting a job like that and it's you it happened yeah and it's all timing right like if that had happened in a different year the timing doesn't line up like because you mentioned it, i'll slide dave passion there too dave was there yes uh between doug logan and uh, mark for a couple three years and then moved on to the cardinals and now everything he does at ESPN along with that great guy, uh, Dave. So, you know, at the time there had been some changeover and the lacrosse job at the time, which was my entry into it was they hadn't started doing lacrosse. It's speaking of AER, AER had been the voice of lacrosse for at the time, 50 some odd years. Now they've been doing it 70 some odd years, but there had not been professional radio lacrosse broadcasts until 2001 and people that did that Carter Blackburn mentioned him. He was the first guy uh, that did it. And it, you know, for the first few years, it kind of had been because the way the student station works is you, the main year you do lacrosse is your junior year. And then you kind of go through the end of basketball season, your senior year and turn it over to the rising uh, juniors. And they are the lead on lacrosse 
uh, the next year. So for a few years in a row, you know, an outgoing senior essentially done lacrosse. Uh, women's basketball was not done commercially on the radio, and that's just the way it was. The job as created in what turned out to be the summer after my senior year is, is to some extent the job I have now, which is lacrosse, women's basketball, and uh, my football responsibilities, which uh, expanded uh, a little bit after the first couple of years. So it was a new job. But had the same thing happened like a year earlier or a year later, uh, who's to say? Like a year earlier, I'm, I'm not getting that job. It probably would have been somebody that graduated in 2003. A year later, now I certainly would have been qualified for the job, but who knows what would have happened in that year? I clearly would have had to go get a, another job or who knows what I would would have been doing. So I would have been qualified for it, but maybe the timing wouldn't have worked out. So, so you're right. Like the fact that it worked out like that and combine it with the Valley Cats, I'll tell you, go figure the longest road trip in the Penn League at that time. And I've lost track of who's in what league anymore. So it no longer <laughs> uh, matters, but I was in lovely Niles, Ohio to visit the Mahoning Valley uh, scrappers. When I got the phone call that I, I got the gig. So you're now you're eight hours or whatever, a long bus ride from home. You're like, wow, that really worked out. <laughs> but, you know, it just as easily couldn't have. So, uh, yeah, it, you're right. Uh, timing is everything in life, right, Tom? And it just so happened uh, way back in 2004, the timing uh, worked out pretty well for me. Amazing to see that all come together. And by the way, thank you for mentioning Dave Pash. I think Bill Walton's the only one to forget who Dave Pash is. I uh, yeah, Bill, Bill will figure it out one of these days, right? <laughs> Dave, Dave, like, you talk about it, and just a aside, like, so many guys went to Syracuse. I don't know how many people know Dave went to Syracuse, but he did. And it's you look at ESPN's roster. If you want to place a bet, did that guy go to Syracuse? Bet yes, you're going to be right more often uh, than not. But, you know, Dave's one of those guys, and, like, he's on the list of of really good Syracuse broadcasters out there. He's a great guy. He's always available if you uh, need to drop him a line or whatever. There's a great picture out there. It got taken, like, Dave's first year, and it was, like, all these – Guys going back, I don't know why all these people were in the same place at the university, but it's going back to the times of like Hank Greenwald and uh, lots of older guys and Costas and all these guys are in this picture. And then like young sparky Dave Pash is in the picture for the only reason that he just happened to get the job recently. So Dave's got all this great picture of him, and like every other legend of Syracuse broadcasting uh, to that point that he happens to be in. It's great stuff there. I love it. Love all his work he continues to do. Now, you kind of gave me a little tease there about your expanding responsibilities and expanding jobs because you're all over the place now because you mentioned your football responsibilities have changed, but also you're on the radio locally, you're teaching. You, I feel like, I don't know, maybe he'll be on the show eventually, somebody, but like you and Stephen Fonte feel like you guys are constantly doing everything across the board from like the moment you wake up to the moment you're asleep. Let's let's hear about some of the jobs that involve your daily tasks from Monday to Sunday. Really, I'm not sure if Steve sleeps, but that that's a, a different <laughs> thing. I, I I do not put in the hours that Steve puts in. I, I I'll say that I, I don't quite know how he how he does that uh, throughout the day. But yeah, I, I have a radio show now on the ESPN station in, in Syracuse uh, in the afternoon. So that's a, a daily thing Monday through Friday, and that's been uh, fun to do here. That started uh, the current variation of it back in back in January and we'll be back at that when uh, football season starts in the fall a few weeks be uh, before and uh, you know it's uh, it's a lot of stuff it's uh, it's getting ready for the games uh, you got to go to all the interview sessions and get all your sound for uh, for football games especially during football season it's uh, it's a very and and I think this speaks to football in itself it's a regimented week in that the stuff's at the same time every week and you're going to talk to the guys and you're, you're getting your interviews ready and uh, now I'll be working in this uh, daily show in the fall and uh, you're getting all your prep ready uh, for for the game. So and then you get into basketball season, the rhythm's a little different because you, you got a couple of games a week. So it's not quite always a Monday is this Tuesday is is that. But, you, you know, you got to get ready for the games and a, a lot of the, the work you do. And I, I'd say this is maybe what people don't know about sports broadcasting or any broadcasting for that matter is like people that watch or listen to these broadcasts, you see us on the air and I'm not saying this for everybody. I, th I think a lot of people think you show up, you call the game and you go home. Like you got to know what you're talking about. Well, that happens during the time that it is not your, your work is not being seen. That is the time you're sitting in front of your computer grinding and, and learning stuff 
about uh, your own team or the other teams or disappearing down a rabbit hole that to find some story that may or may not ever actually get on the air. Like uh, my, my theory that I tell students or anybody is this, is that it, uh, a broadcast is this or calling a game is this uh, you prep like heck and then you wing it. Like you need to know all the stuff, but a, a game is going to do whatever a game's going to do. <laughs> Like you, you can prep as much as you want and the game's going to say, great, uh, I'm doing something else today. So uh, you're not going to talk about that. Or if you do, it's going to make literally no sense because I went over here and did this thing. So you got to be prepared for every conceivable scenario and you may use 15, 20% of, of the stuff you prepared for that day, but you don't know which 15 or 20% that's going to be. So the week is getting ready for all 100% of whatever it can be. <laughs> And then uh, using uh, your own decision-making power on Saturday for football or, you know, a Thursday night for women's basketball to put out there. All right, here's the 20% the, the audience needs to know about, and we're, we're going to figure this out over the next two hours. It's fantastic advice, and I want to continue with that. The best advice, whether it's somebody who's grown up in the capital region, maybe it's a young Syracuse student, a broadcasting student that says, you know what, I want to do this. What is the best advice you can offer an aspiring broadcaster or young broadcaster? Get where you are in your career right now. Um, don't quit on it. Like you're gonna do your first game or practice tape or whatever, and uh, two things are going to happen. Either you think you're going to, either you're gonna listen back to it and think you stink, and you're right, probably. <laughs> like nobody's first try it, it's very good. Um, or, and this is probably worse, you're going to listen back to it and think you were great. Well, more likely than not, you're wrong. Like, you got to you gotta work at it. It's not, calling games is not necessarily a natural thing. It's not something that you fall out of bed ready made to do on day one. It's not a, a natural way necessarily of talking or thinking or any of that. So it's something you got to work at. And it's something that you have to understand you are going to get better at. And you are not going to get better at it without hearing from other people who also know how to do it. And going back to the beginning when we were talking about WAER, like getting cleared to do a game on that station is you go at the time again, take a tape player. Now I think a lot of people do it into their phones or whatever. You go to a random high school that has a random game happening and you go to the top of the bleachers and you sit there and you either call it by yourself into a tape recorder or you go there with somebody else that's doing the same thing and that's your color analyst for this broadcast that maybe two other people are ever going to hear because they're going to listen to five minutes to tell you uh, what you did wrong and how to get better. And that's what you have to do. And if you don't want to do that at the beginning, you are never going to get to uh, the end. Like, I, I'm sure I could go back and listen to anything I did back then, and I'd say, wow, that wasn't very good. And I'm sure at the time I thought, hey, that's pretty good. And both things are correct. <laughs> and I think that's what you got to know. Like back then, like good, good is a sliding scale on it. You could be good for 18. You could be good for 20. Unless you're pretty much Mike Tirico. He, he's one of the only ones that I could think of that was ready to do this when he was 19 years old and clearly he's better now, but like that dude was uh, literally ready to go on this stuff when he was that age, basically nobody else ever was for the most part. Like you got to know that you need to get better and you're going to get better and not to be discouraged by it because it can be very discouraging when you, when you do a game and you don't remember anybody's name and you think you stink and all that stuff, but you got to work on it because it it is not, it is not, it's not like a reflex or something. It's an acquired skill and it's a skill you have to work at to get better. And I think that's the main thing. You, you need to understand that this stuff requires legit work to get better at it. That changing expectations of what you thought was good this year is not the same. It's like height. It's like weight. It's relative. Whatever yeah. you think was good, it changes throughout your life. That's great advice. Uh, Brian Higgins, I appreciate you doing this. You know this, for months since I've launched this podcast, you are one of the number one people I've been trying to chase down because our stories, this is like the first time we've actually got to professionally talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Basically, like, ever talk to each other before. Brian's probably like, how the hell did God's get my number? Don't worry about that. That's a story for another podcast, but it's amazing. You grew up in Albany. You're working in Syracuse. I grew up in Syracuse. I'm working in Albany. 
We've had so many different paths cross of people, and now our paths get to cross and share these stories like this. Uh, get ready for me to probably annoy you on social media during some coaches' shows and some radio shows and everything else this upcoming fall. Thank you for doing this. I'm looking forward to staying in touch for the future. Yeah, Tom, I'm, I'm, I, I apologize again over the last, like, 98 months of somehow the timing never <laughs> worked out on, uh, on this, but uh, glad we could finally uh, – hook up and uh you know hopefully people back at home uh, you know if any high school students or whatever are watching this can take something out of it or uh, you know hopefully anybody that's a, a young prospective broadcaster can uh, take some stuff out of it that you know it's not the easiest thing but you know this time for for anyone that grows up like in the park themselves on the couch watching football all day uh, on sunday and thinking how can i do this like this is fun i want to I want to do this, which at the time is, you know, sitting on the floor watching sports. Like, yeah, it's work. But at the same time, when you get to show up at a game and they give you a paycheck, like, that's pretty good. That's good stuff. Bro, I appreciate you, man. All right, Tom. Thanks so much.